So welcome. So this is a brief course on detecting and understanding glaucoma with OCT. Of course, by brief course, I mean it's about an hour, but you can, of course, watch it in smaller portions if you like. <clears throat> so this is actually taken, or we're redoing this, from a course given at the American Academy of Optometry meeting in San Diego in October of 2022. There, there are actually four of us involved in that meeting. Uh, we're just going to re-record here the first four sessions, which were the didactic sessions in which I'm giving two lectures on detecting and understanding glaucoma with OCT. And Mike Siglazian is going to be giving uh, two 10-minute tutorials where he'll present examples. So without further ado, let's just get started. So first, my financial disclosures. Uh, this the obligatory uh, disclosures. I have funding uh, and equipment from both TopCon and Heidelberg, and it's certainly relevant to this lecture. Right, here's the outline. Before I tell you about a simplified method for detecting and understanding glaucoma with OCT, <clears throat> I'm going to first uh, go over some basics. And some of you may know uh, most of this material, but it's going to be very brief, and it's going to supply the terms an approach that we're going to be using. So to understand the patterns of glaucomatous damage seen with OCT, you have to keep the following in mind. First of all, as you know, glaucoma kills ganglion cells and their axons. This means you have to understand where those ganglion cells are and how those axons travel to the optic disc. So here's a schematic that you've all seen in some form, I suspect. It's meant to capture the following characteristics of the anatomy. The ganglion cells here on the disc uh, side um, of the uh, fovea send their axons, which we'll also refer to as retinal nerve fibers, they send their retinal nerve fibers or axons directly into the disc. The ganglion cells on the uh, opposite side, the temporal side, arc around and bunch up down here uh, where they meet axons from other parts of the retina because you're only looking about at about this much here of the back of my eye. So you have other axons coming in here. So this is a particularly thick region of axons and it's also a region that's particularly vulnerable to damage from glaucoma. Now the same thing is happening up here. I'm not going to draw them all in. But essentially, you've got two regions here that are particularly vulnerable to glaucomatous damage. All right, the third point, initial damage occurs in or at the disc. So as far as we know, most of the damage occurs first there. That means since the damage is occurring first in this region here, you're going to get arcuate uh, patterns. You're going to get patterns very typical of glaucoma. All right, so here I'm going to superimpose these bundle tracings from Jansonius, just to illustrate the point. Any damage in this region here would produce some kind of an arcuate defect within that yellow region. These are just examples. Any damage within this blue region, likewise, arcuate patterns. Here, you'd get a very tight arcuate. Here, it wouldn't quite look like an arcuate, but it's the same logic. That's very characteristic of glaucoma. All right. Now, Here's the important point. We are looking for patterns that are characteristic of glaucomatous damage. We are not looking at pie charts. Glaucoma does not change the color of a pie chart. It changes the anatomy of your patient. So you don't want to be looking at these. You want to be looking at the patterns. So we're going to use OCT. I think most of you know it's a non-invasive measure of human anatomy. And you can sort of think about it as ultrasound but with light and just the way you can pick up a millimeter or two with ultrasound say in the breast here because light has a, a shorter wavelength the resolution is much better on the order of 10 microns or less so here's a b scan or oct scan through just uh, the fovea of a healthy eye the ganglion cells would be, be there here is the, its axone or retinal nerve fiber that's traveling to the disc and then into the disc. So glaucoma is going to kill these layers here, the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer, 
and it's going to kill the retinal nerve fibrillator. When I say ganglion cell, it's really short for ganglion cell plus in a plexiform layer in the rest of the lecture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so now we can turn to a simplified method, which we call the CU, which stands for Columbia University OCT-based method. And here are two um, articles, one by Jeff Liebman, who um, is a vice chair of the Department of Columbia and director of glaucoma, and one by where I'm the first author. And they describe the technique. The technique makes use of what's called, at least by two manufacturers, a hood report. This is a one-page report that we actually initially published in 2014 as a way to help clinicians quickly diagnose and understand glaucoma. So we're not going to make use of these pie charts. We're not going to use this, at least for our purposes here. All right, so now the, the CU method makes use of this report, and it involves three questions for the clinician to answer. The first two questions involve the retinal nerve fiber layer probability map and the ganglion cell placenta plexiform layer probability map. So it's absolutely vital that you understand these maps. So that's what I'm going to tell you next. And so this is an important point to pay attention to. So these sometimes are called deviation maps. We call them probability maps. The same thing. Here's how they're formed. All right, so first of all, where, where can you find them? You can find uh, 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 on Topcon and Heidelberg, there are uh, hood reports. Uh, Zeiss has some of the same material in this panel map. All right. This is the ganglion cell probability map here on this report. Here's the retinal nerve fiber layer map. Here they are on this report. On this report, this combines essentially what we're calling the ganglion cell probability map along with the retinal nerve fiber layer map. So it's as if you superimpose these two. Okay, I'll say more. For those of you, most of the examples here are going to come from these machines. For those of you who are using Zeiss, at the very end of the lecture, there's a special little section that tells you where to look for the equivalent information. All right, and if you can't find this information, call your rep. All right, so, so these probability maps are derived from thickness maps. So in this case, you've got a wide field scan through the phobia and the disc. Here's a single B scan. This is the retinal nerve fiber layer here. This is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness map. Red means thick, blue means thin. This over here is the retinal nerve fiber layer probability map. It's obtained from this by the software. The software compares point by point the thickness of the patient to the thickness of healthy controls and produces this probability map. Now, we do something a little uh, that, that um, may be confusing at first, but I'll tell you why we do it. We flip this along the horizontal meridian. So now this is inferior retina superior visual field, where this was inferior retina superior, uh, uh, inferior visual field superior retina. We flip this because we want to put this in field view because you'll often want to compare abnormal points in the visual field to abnormal points on the OCT, and this allows you to do it easily. Okay. In any case, green means within normal limits, yellow is significant at about the 5% level, red is 1%. Okay, now, you might notice red is good here, it's thick, red is bad here. Sorry about that, it's not my fault, that's the convention in the field. So you can see this defect here, which is blue, shows up here, which is red. All right, same thing for the ganglion cell. We're just going to look at the center, um, plus or minus about 10 degrees. We're going to look at the ganglion cell plus inner plexiform layer thickness. There's the thickness map. Thick, thin. We turn this into a probability map. Again, same code for color. Dark red, by the way, is significant at the 0.1%. Again, this is flipped. So this is inferior retina. And this is um, this is inferior retina. This is inferior retina. So this dark, this missing piece of this donut is this abnormal region here. 
All right, so it's essential to understand these probability maps. If that wasn't clear, hit rewind and go back over this. Of course, you'll we'll just hear the same thing again, but hopefully if it wasn't clear the first time, it'll be clear the second time. Okay, so three questions. Let's, let's get to question number one. Question number one for the clinician to ask is, is there an arcuate-like abnormal region on the retinal nerve fiber layer probability map right here? associated with the temporal half of the disc. So let's say, let me say, so what do we mean by that? So what do we mean by an arcuate-like abnormal region? Well, one of these regions that are consistent with glaucoma. And this is the temporal half of the disc. This is the part that's associated with most of your 24-2 visual field and so on. So we're going to focus on that part. All right, so here are some examples. This comes from two studies we published recently. Here are the references. And these are retinal nerve fiber layer probability maps from uh, eyes with advanced glaucoma. Advanced glaucoma defined as an eye with glaucoma that has a 24-2 mean deviation worse than minus 12. It's an arbitrary definition. You can see the, they all have red arcuates, largely in both hemifields, in fact. If you blow one of these up and superimpose it here, you can see how it fits our schematic. Here are eyes with moderate glaucoma, meaning that the 24-2 is between minus 6 and about minus 12. And again, you can see most of them have clear uh, arcuates. In fact, they all have clear arcuates in this case. By the way, all eyes here are being displayed as if they were right eyes. So let's blow one of these up. And again, you can see the agreement. Here are eyes with early glaucoma. This is going to, They're a little trickier in some cases, many of them have clear arcuates like this, right? Some of them have subtle hints of an arcuate. All right, so those are the ones that we're going to have to focus on because they're going to be the more difficult ones. Now, for now, what I want you to notice is that all of these, even with the most subtle of damage, have red near the disc. They all show some red near the disc. Okay? There, there. There. All right, so this is going to give us a rule for no. So you, the, the, the three questions, for each question, your choice is yes, no, or uncertain. So why, when would you say no to question number one? Well, here's your rule. If the retinal nerve fiber layer probability map does not have a red region near the temporal half of the disc, then the answer to question one is no. All of these are no because they lack a red region near the temporal half of the disc. Many healthy eyes will look like this. Some could have a little artifact. This has to do with where you're positioning the center. Right? Some scattered artifacts. This is an artifact uh, segmentation probably. But the point being, you say no to all of these eyes. So that's not glaucoma. <clears throat> okay, so what that means is if this is a report for a patient. You look at this, no, you're essentially done. That's it. There's a very, very, very high probability that this eye does not have glaucoma. I'll tell you, at some future lecture, I'll tell you the, the minor exceptions. Not glaucoma. All right? It's always good to look at the B scans, and in fact, at the whole report, but we'll talk about more, more of that in the second lecture. But, you know, you want to at least take a fast look to see if this looks reasonable. Here's another one. There's a little yellow there, but that's not going to bother you. That's still no. You're done. Now, again, take a look at this. And actually, if you look at this, there's an explanation for why you get that little bit of yellow. It's, this part here is shifted a little bit compared to most normals. But don't worry about that. That's a minor detail. The point is, you would be done without even looking at this. It's always good to look at it. All right. So, in this recent study we published, we had 254 healthy controls. 92% of them were simple no's and you were done. Whereas none of the patients uh, were um, false negatives. All right, what's the rule for yes? So, the rule for yes is if an arcuate, a ready yellow, a yellow extends beyond the vertical mid midline, then the answer to question one is yes. All right, so. So this requires um, an arcuate type 
red region near the um, uh, the disc that then extends past the midline, this ver vertical red line. Right? This rule excludes nearly all arcuate-like artifacts. Now, what's an arcuate-like artifact? This has sometimes been called in the in the field uh, red disease, um, uh, sarcastically. So here are uh, eight um, healthy eyes. These are all healthy eyes. We had 200 healthy eyes in this study. Eight of them look like this, right? These are arcuate-like artifacts. They can occur in healthy uh, eyes. Our estimate is you're going to get it about 4% of the time, so you better be able to detect it or those patients are going to be, those healthy patients are going to be false positives. So here's how we're going to deal with it. It is extremely rare for this artifact to cross the midline. So that's the, that's the reason for the requirement extends beyond the vertical uh, midline. So let's, by the way, these are, just to remind you, these are all healthy eyes with artifacts, but they don't cross the midline. All right, so on the other hand, Glaucomatous arcuates, uh, 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 not always, but often do. Very typically, this is what you see. Occasionally, it may not quite cross. Okay, all right, so, all right. So, let's take some examples. Right? All of these eyes had some red that crossed the midline. All right, so, what's next? So. So you have yes, you have no, later we'll get to uncertain, but uncertain is going to be anything that isn't yes or no, and I'll tell you more about uncertain in the second lecture. All right, so this gets us to the second question. I said there were three questions. The first question concerned the retinal nerve fibrillate probability map. So the second question, as you might have guessed, concerns the ganglion cell probability map. All right, so... If the answer to the first question is yes, you're not done yet. Right, you go to question two. Is there a topographically corresponding abnormal region on the probability map? Now, what does that mean? Well, that's the probability map, right? So what do we mean by corresponding um, arcuate region, right? Or the same arcuate region? Well, if you put this on top of this, you can see it's part of the same arcuate, right? You know, you don't have to do that physically. You can do that mentally in your mind's eye, as they say. All right, so let's, let's take, go to these examples and ask about question two. Here are the ganglion cells. You can see all of these, you've got agreement here, right? That is, the abnormal regions on the retinal nerve fibrillae and the ganglion cell maps are part of the same arcuate in all of these. In this case, so this is yes, no, no, you don't have evidence, and here I'm uncertain. All right? So let's get rid of these. So here's the good news. If this is yes and this is yes, you are done. That is optic neuropathy consistent with glaucoma. And you'll notice I said optic neuropathy consistent with glaucoma. The reason for that is that you really have to rule out other um, causes, other optic neuropathies like ION and so on uh, with photos in your clinical exam. Okay, so it assumes that the clinical exam has ruled out other causes. Yes, yes, by the way, also implies you've got damage to the most critical part of the retina, the macula. All right, so let's take an example. The answer here this is to question one is yes, of course, is the midline. All right? How about question two? Oh, yes, right? Look at that, part of the same argument. You are done. This is optic neuropathy consistent with glaucoma. Always wise to check the B-scan. There it is. You can actually see the defect. Another example, of course, is the midline. Yes. What about this? Yes. That's all part of the same arcuate. Right. Again, optic neuropathy consistent with glaucoma. Always wise to check it. If you check it, you can actually see the defect here. All right. So 
Turns out, in, in the study we did, 97% of the patients with uh, uh, moderate or advanced glaucoma were yes yeses. 72% of the early glaucoma eyes were yes yeses. None of the healthy controls. And I already told you that there were no false positives here, right? And 92% of the healthy controls were here. So 92 here, zero here, we're missing some. Zero here, 72, we're missing some. Where are those, all right? So essentially, what I'm telling you is with just these two questions, 70 to 90% of your cases will be one of those routes. If you have a lot of healthy controls, it'll be closer to 90 plus. If you have a lot of early glaucoma, it'll be closer to 70. What about the other eyes, right? Well, what are the other eyes? The other eyes are the ones that were yes, but then uncertain, or uncertain initially. And for both of those, we go to the full report in question three. And, I'll, and based on question three, which I'll tell you about later, we then ultimately wind up with everyone categorized as yes, no, or uncertain. So we're going to talk about that in part two. So let me just summarize here. This method is designed to save you time, to avoid some common mistakes, to help you understand the nature and degree of damage, and to help you, uh, teach you about the rest of the report, which I'll say more about later in part two. But first, we're going to hear from Mike Shiglazian from the uh, Illinois College of Optometry, and he has some really nice uh, cases that will um, reinforce the points that have been made in this study in a clinical setting. Mike. Thanks, Don. Uh, pleasure to be here with you and everyone else. Uh, I'm going to continue on our course providing six short case examples where I'll take a slightly deeper dive into the uh, interpretation and analysis that uh, you've presented thus far. Uh, my financial disclosures are at the bottom of the slide here and let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just as note for the purposes uh, of this portion of slides, uh, my video occupies some uh, important screen real estate, so I'm going to turn off the video for uh, the remainder of the presentation. Okay, our first case is a 65-year-old African-American female. Uh, she's a new patient to myself at uh, the Illinois College of Optometry. She was told at a previous exam that she might have glaucoma and she was referred for further evaluation. Uh, the ocular and medical history is unremarkable. Her IOP was 22 in the right eye, 21 in the left eye, and her central corneal thickness was 550. Um, essentially, you can consider the remainder of the clinical exam to be non-contributory. Uh, I'm not putting any red herrings in here. We're just looking at some of the uh, classical examples at first and then uh, some other uh, case examples that can present as glaucoma or as glaucoma suspects. So here is the uh, TopCon uh, Maestro report, uh, the hood version uh, that Don has developed. Uh, as you know, we are answering questions here. Our first question to answer is uh, about an arcuate-like abnormal region on the retinal nerve fiber layer probability map associated with the temporal half, half of the disc. So, of course, uh, this is the probability map up here for the retinal nerve fiber layer. You see the red arcuate defect there. It's easy and significant. I chose an easy case to start with. Uh, so the answer there is yes. Uh, the second question is, uh, is there a topographically corresponding abnormal region to the ganglion cell layer uh, probability map? So that's right down below. And uh, when you have a contiguous, if you were to align these up uh, anatomically, you have a contiguous region uh, that, course, that transponds and, and covers both the retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer. So uh, two yeses there, uh, really sort of a slam dunk for highly certain that this is a uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Again, as Don mentioned earlier, that would have to be consistent with the remainder of the clinical findings. Uh, for further demonstration, you might take a look at the retinal nerve fiber layer uh, B scan. Uh, that's uh, you know well displayed on this report. You can see the thinning there, and then the abnormality on the Enstein uh, uh, map down below. And also, if you look to the uh, RNFL thickness map down below. 
you see in the on FOSS view, the uh, inferior uh, RNFL defect in, in dark blue there. Uh, let's take a look at the left eye for this patient. Uh, again, the easy case at first, uh, arcuate uh, defect in the uh, probability map associated with the RNFL, absolutely a yes. It crosses the vertical midline, it connects back to the disc. Uh, is it associated with the defect on the ganglion cell layer map? Uh, yes, it is. Those two things are contiguous there. Uh, there's a defect on the B scan. And there's also an abnormality uh, defect on the RNFL thickness map. So uh, quite a clear case. These are the this is the classical case. You know the definitive easy cases match up like this. You can be very very certain that this is glaucoma. Uh, again, uh, considering that the rest of the clinical findings uh, are consistent with with this disease. Uh, just to throw in the visual fields for this patient. Uh, you know, the right eye certainly shows a glaucomatous like defect there. It's uh, arcuate, it's dense and close to fixation that goes along with uh, the ganglion cell layer map. Of course, doing a 10 2 on this patient at some point would make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the left eye, though, there's, you know, perhaps an early superior nasal step there um, on the total and pattern deviation maps. Uh, certainly you'd want to evaluate that further as well but you know you've already sort of made the diagnosis just based on the OCT if you are uh, using more of the Cirrus, uh, Zycirus instrument, here are the panel map reports that Don mentioned. So uh, you can look at the uh, right eye over here and you see that the ganglion cell uh, defect inferiorly is you know, just about matching up. It doesn't always line up perfectly there because of the, the two separate scans are stitched together. Remember, you have a separate scan on the macula and a separate scan for the optic nerve head. It's not all done in, in one scan as it is on the TopCon device. So that's a yes. Um, you know, very certain that that's likely glaucoma. On the left side, you see uh, it's a little bit more contiguous. It lines up better. And you see a, an inferior arcuate-like defect, both for the retinal nerve fiber layer as well as for the ganglion cell region. So uh, both answers to question one and two are yes and uh, you're really very certain this is glaucoma from this report if you're using the uh, older traditional reports from the zeiss instrument here's your rnfl report on the left side the ganglion cell report on the right side you just have to again i, I would put them both up on the screen if possible so you can look at them at the same time and then just know in your head you have to align these uh these two regions together for the right and left eye to identify that there is a uh, uh, contiguous and corresponding region between the RNFL and the ganglion cell layer. When you have those two things, you're, uh, again, highly certain. Here are color photographs from this patient. Um, I'll let you decide how easy it is to identify the uh, ner retinal nerve fiber layer loss on the color photograph, as well as uh, thinning to the inferior neuroretinal rim, a little bit of notching and whatnot. So uh, the whole case comes together here. And in summary, though, uh, I think it's important to identify that our OCT probability maps alone were able to identify glaucoma. And so depending on uh, your ability to obtain the visual field, of course, that's necessary, but uh, you may have a, a different time course for doing that depending on your practice setting um, and your approach to the disease. Uh, we do want to you know, obtain the 24-2 and 10-2 and identify the potential for functional loss, but we've made our diagnosis just based on the OCT alone. Uh, we're more confident uh, and potentially we save some time in, in uh, obtaining all of that. For case two here, this is a 44-year-old African-American male. The pressures are 24 and 25. Uh, in addition to the elevated pressures, he was also referred in because the uh, referring clinician noted a large disc and large cupping. Uh, the medical history is significant for systemic hypertension, and there's a positive uh, family history of glaucoma. On the TopCon report here, you can see that, you know, answer to question one is definitely a yes. There's both a uh, superior and inferior 
uh, arcuate loss. Uh, so clearly the superior one is crossing the midline, even the inferior one is, is crossing the midline as well. And more importantly, both of those line up with loss on the ganglion cell map down below. So uh, yes to question one, yes to question two. Uh, we can take a look at the uh, B scan report. We can take a look at the uh, defects there on the uh, Enston uh, plot and even on the uh, probability map, uh, I'm sorry, the color map down below, uh, putting the uh, entire report together just to be more complete. For the, this patient's left eye, again, pressures were elevated in this eye, uh, suspicious for glaucoma. The OCT for the right eye uh, for the RNFL on the probability map is definitely a yes and is also a yes on the ganglion cell layer map down below that corresponds anatomically. Uh, that really makes our case. Uh, there's some uh, thinning to the, uh, to the B scan on the circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, and that's uh, identified on the instant plot down below. Uh, for the visual fields for this patient, uh, they were less consistent with clear disease. This is a first-time visual field test with 24-2s for the patient. Uh, certainly, they need to be repeated. Um, and of course, with the central loss that we saw on the ganglion cell map, uh, a 10-2 would be in order for this patient as well to identify uh, central field defects. And here are the uh, color disc photos for the patient. Uh, just to complete the clinical picture for you, remember this patient was first noted to have a large disc, deep cupping, uh, elevated intraocular pressures. You can certainly see that on the uh, on the color photographs here. You might even note uh, some early retinal nerve fiber layer changes here uh, on the right eye. Uh, certainly some thinning to the neuroretinal rim in each eye. So for our third case, we have a 66-year-old uh, female patient with exfoliation syndrome or exfoliation uh, pseudo-exfoliation uh, syndrome. Uh, pressures are uh, elevated at 26 and 30. Uh, currently, she's untreated. I've been following her for a little bit and have uh, a number of tests uh, of OCTs and visual fields for her. And although this is cer certainly a high-risk patient and uh, certainly would consider treatment, uh, at this point in time, because of the confidence I have in the OCT reports uh, from the maestro here, there is no arcuate-like uh, temporal defect uh, crossing the vertical midline there uh, on this report that corresponds uh, to the retinal ganglion cell map down below. So while there's maybe some suspicious changes here and the pressures are elevated, um, I'm still following this patient very closely. I understand that this is a high-risk patient and you know many times they will initiate therapy earlier than later on these patients. At this point in time, the uh, OCT maps are, are giving me great confidence yet, that this patient does uh, not have overt disease at this point. Uh, taking a look at the left eye, we find similar findings. Again, sometimes you'll see little blotchy, mostly just artifact-like uh, changes that we're not too worried about, especially when they uh, do not correspond to what's going on on the ganglion cell layer map. Uh, so we can look at the uh, circumpapillary uh, retinal nerve fiber layer on the Enston plot and the B scan, and um, a, a patient sure to be watched uh, closely. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we're uh, just observing her. And uh, this, uh, these are the color photographs for that patient. You can see there's only a, a small cup. Um, it's really difficult to see the retinal nerve fiber layer here, uh, intact uh, neuroretinal rim and sharp disc margin. And on visual fields, they sometimes fluctuate for this patient. Uh, there certainly have not been any uh, repeatable uh, glaucomatous-like defects. There's a generalized depression for the right eye on one date. And then on an earlier date, I tried doing the 24-2C uh, pattern, uh, did not find any defects uh, with that uh, field for the left eye. So in summary, the uh, Columbia University method, uh, just looking at question one and question two uh, for the retinal nerve fiber layer arcuate defects and the ganglion cell, or, ganglion cell or layer map uh, gave me confidence and potentially could have saved me time on repeating a lot of these other tests for this patient. So there's no, no glaucoma disease at present. Uh, for this fourth patient, uh, this is a patient with diabetes and hypertension. 
but was also uh, seen and evaluated due to a large cup disc ratio in the right and left eye and a positive family history of glaucoma. Uh, pressures uh, were uh, between 16 and 19 in each eye on uh, a couple of visits, and overall the patient was just a, a very poor visual field test taker. So for this case, let me start you out with the disc photo. So um, maybe this is the way we approach things in clinic more regularly. Take a look in the back of the eye. Um, here you can detect a cotton wool spot associated with the diabetes and high blood pressure, but there's not really any other significant uh, diabetic retinopathy at this time. Uh, focusing on the optic disc, there's peripapillary atrophy, a large cup, and a potentially a thin temporal rim. It's difficult to make out much about the retinal nerve fiber layer there. Uh, the left eye photograph is washed out, also appears to be a large cup, maybe a thin temporal rim, uh, no overt glaucomatous changes there. Uh, for the patient, uh, she was not a good visual field test taker, uh, quite unreliable, uh, with very high false negatives uh, for each of these tests here, 26% and 21%. Um, and you know the appearance of defects on the uh, grayscale and the pattern deviation plot that just don't line up with glaucoma. Uh, we were trying repeating this test uh, a, while, a while later and giving her clear instructions and still just could not get uh, good results uh, from the patient. So, uh, you know, a lot of frustrating time there for the patient and for us. Let's look to see if the OCT in our interpretation using the CU method could have saved us some time and give us uh, greater confidence in uh, what this patient has or doesn't have in terms of the uh, glaucoma disease or suspicion of glaucoma disease. So no abnormal findings on the RNFL probability map. Um, and that's really, you know, the end of the story. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, you know, this type of noise or artifact, especially in patients with diabetes or other maculopathies, but uh, abnormalities on the ganglion cell plot alone um, are often more likely to be artifact or unrelated to glaucoma. Uh, and so we're really looking for the continuity between RNFL loss and the ganglion cell layer losses, as, as we've pointed out. Uh, you can, of course, examine the rest of the report, the uh, B-scan for the circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, uh, the Enstein plot, and the color map down below all really substantiate that there's uh, no glaucoma disease on the, this patient's right eye, uh, nor is there anything for the patient's left eye. Again, nothing on the retinal nerve fiber layer uh, probability map, uh, nothing really on the uh, ganglion cell layer map except this you know, noise artifact, um, not likely to be glaucoma related disease. Uh, do, do, do your due diligence and look at the B scan for the circumpapillary RNFL, uh, look at the Enstein plot and the color map down below. So uh, we've you know, taking a patient with a multitude of findings, this is not really a healthy control patient because of the diabetes and hypertension, but, uh, you know, besides putting these this patient through those courses of visual field tests, we probably could have avoided some of that and just followed her with the OCT um, because we're quite confident in the findings that we're seeing here. Our fifth case is a 64-year-old white male with pressures of 30 and 26. Uh, there's a positive family history. Uh, the uh, OCT report shows quite clearly that there's a retinal nerve fiber layer loss as well as a ganglion cell layer loss. Uh, we see it on the uh, Enstein plot there and the, uh, on the B scan. So we're quite clear that this is a glaucoma disease. In this case, it is also corresponding to the field defect. So we're going to get into uh, this correspondence between the visual field and the probability map where we've superimposed the 24-2 point grid. So you can line this up just as I've done this here. And we're going to do a more of that in the next section. Here's the 10-2 uh, for this patient. Of course, that's uh, uh, an important aspect of evaluating these patients for their uh, central uh, visual field loss. And here's the patient's uh, left eye. Uh, no for the RNFL, nothing on the ganglion cell uh, layer map. Um, the visual field is normal for the 24-2 and for the 10-2. Uh, here are the reports for this patient with the uh, pano map. 
Uh, this is from the Zeiss instrument, and yes, you can see that there is correspondence for the right eye between the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer. Now, you often get this, uh, as uh, Don calls it, a cookie cutter like uh, circular uh, ar uh, artifact um, in the ganglion cell region. It more or less lines up. Uh, as best it can with this, uh, with these two separate scans that were obtained um, uh, for the patient's right eye. And so uh, that's clearly a, a yes and a yes there for question one and question two, and then a no and a no for the patient's left eye. And if you're using the Heidelberg device, uh, there's also a, uh, a similar map without the uh, probability reports, unfortunately, at this time. Uh, you just have thickness maps uh, for the uh, retina view and then inverted for the field view so that you could uh, match it up uh, to the visual field. Um, so the probability maps, as I mentioned, are, are available outside the US at this point in time, but not available in the US. Again, talk to your rep and, and uh, see what's going on with that. Uh, here you can also take a, a close look at the B scan and the instant report down here. So yes and yes, and we have good correspondence there uh, all the way through on the RNFL. And so for our final case here, this is a 41-year-old female with pressures of 26 to 30 in the right eye, 25 to 29 in the left eye, a corneal thickness of 560 and 567. The hysteresis is uh, essentially normal and the, uh, there's a negative family history of disease. So a mixture of clinical findings there. Uh, for this case, we'll start with the uh, disc photos. Uh, so take a careful look there, see if you can identify anything either to the disc and cup and neuroretinal rim or to the retinal nerve fiber layer. There's frankly not too much there to see in terms of uh, overt glaucomas changes. The uh, TopCon report is uh, no for the retinal nerve fiber layer, no on the ganglion cell layer, uh, and everything else in the report looks pretty normal. Uh, the left eye. Now we have probably a yes, you know, it's, it's not the most clear artifact uh, inferiorly here. Uh, it does cross over into this region, um, but it doesn't go back to the disc. So, you know, that's, that's maybe an uncertain or a yes. And then, you know, of course we need to ask question two, is it correlated to anything on the ganglion cell map um, down below? It is not. So, you know, maybe this is just an artifact uh, maybe this is going to be left as a suspect. We would want to look at the rest of the report, uh, you know, obtain a 24-2 visual field and look for any other evidence of disease. Uh, for the same patient, uh, I have panel map reports for the right eye and for the left eye. I think we have a, a no for the RNFL and ganglion cell uh, layer for the uh, right eye. And then again, maybe a yes over here uh, for this uh, left eye, um, but you know, I'm, I'm uncertain about that. That might be an artifact. It doesn't lead all the way back. The cup looks here to be quite small and it's not corresponding to anything in the ganglion cell region. So uh, no and no there. Um, and I, again, I think this is the type of patient I wanted to finish up with where you need to look at the rest of the report so I think this last case brings up the more tricky examples where you need to move on and ask uh, yourself question three that Don is going to uh, review for us again and uh, take us through the steps there so that we can uh, sort out these uh, other more uncertain cases. Thanks. Those were great examples, Mike. Thanks a lot. Um, so this is the second part of the two-part uh, tutorial that I'm providing. And now we're going to talk about decreasing uncertainty and decreasing the number of OCT uh, suspects. So I'll remind you that we, I was, we were talking about the CU OCT-based method that makes use of the Hood Report. And I was telling you that answering the first two questions will allow you to make a decision in about 70 to 90 plus percent of the uh, cases. But uncertainty, uncertain eyes are going to remain. And based on the method, you can get uncertain to question one. And I'll give you examples in a moment. That is 
it was neither yes nor no, so it had to be uncertain. Or you could have yes to question one, but no one uncertain to question two in terms of ganglion cell um, damage consistent with the retinal nerve fiber layer. And in fact, in our recent study, 8% of the healthy controls fell into these categories and almost a third of the early glaucoma ones. So how do you deal with that? Well, again, I told you there were three questions, so it won't surprise you that you go to question three. Right? <clears throat> question three now is, gonna, is going to uh, tell you, say that you need more information than in those probability plots to distinguish between some of the healthy and glaucomatous eyes. And in particular, question three asks you, is there confirmatory, meaning in this case topographic evidence, of a retinal nerve fiber layer defect on the ganglion cell probability map, circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer map, essentially other elements of the report that I'll tell you about in a moment. All right, so what are those other parts? Well, here's a list, and it's a list we're going to go down in terms of check-in. First of all, there's the ganglion cell probability map that you already know about, and the thickness map. Then, so this is the ganglion cell thickness map and probability maps. Remember, this is in retina view, this is in field view. This defect here is associated with this change on the probability map. Then there's the retina nerve fiber layer thickness map, which we haven't made use of yet. We're going to use that now, right? And again, flipped along the horizontal to create this map up here. That's field view. So now these defects here are associated with these abnormal regions here. Okay? Then we have the circumpapillary scan image. This is the actual image uh, derived from a circle around uh, the disc. And then the thickness of the retinal nerve fibrillae, which is the thickness of this reflective region or the distance between these green lines. So we're going to make use of this other information in ways I'm about to tell you about. So this, is, this information here is for a circle around the disc in here. Okay, retinal nerve fibrillae, retinal nerve fibrillae thickness. Circumpapillary retinal nerve fibrillae thickness. All right. So to illustrate what is meant by confirmatory evidence, let me take an example where we really didn't need it, but, but to show you what the evidence would look like. So let's take this example where we said yes to question one, yes to question two. So we already concluded that there's glaucomatous damage, but what can it teach us about the use of the other reports, uh, other elements of the report? So remember this cross the midline here. So this was yes, and there's topographical agreement here. All right, so this is yes. Okay, now, we're going to actually be looking for two things. The first thing we're going to be looking for in terms of topographical agreement is agreement among the same physical location. So what do I mean by that? Well, don't forget we're talking about the temporal half of the disk here. That means we're looking at this section here because temporal part of the disk, the temporal quadrant's in the center here. Now, this may... Some of you who are familiar with the early OCT reports, this may confuse you a little bit because the traditional way of doing this going back to the early Zeiss reports was a so-called T-SNIT plot where the nasal was in the center. That's much harder to use than if you put the temporal in, in, the, in the center. So anyway, this is an instant. What you need to know, that if that was just confusing, forget it. What you need to know is this portion here on this map is this portion here, which means that this location here is this location here, and of course it's that location there, right? And you blow it up and you can see this region here is thinned on the B scan, it's thinned here, boy do you have confirmatory evidence. It's also uh, this location here. So all of these locations say the same thing that there's a defect here, okay? Now the second thing we're going to, uh, to mean, oops, second thing we're going, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So same thing with this physical location. So this 
let me go back a second. So this location right here is, I'm having a little trouble here. This location right here is the same as this location right here, right? right? Which is the same as that location there. So again, you've got agreement among physical locations. Now, the second thing we're going to mean about agreement is the same arcuate. So you should learn to be able to look at this and say, ah, I see where that arcuate defect is, and I see why this pattern exists. So what do I mean by that? All right, so let's go back to these arcuate defects, right? Those are just examples, right? Different examples. You can even have arcuates way out here, right? And, of course, for the left eye, they would look like this. So you have to make, keep in mind whether you have a right eye or a left eye. All right, so this defect here is more or less consistent with this. So this is the region that's affected here. Let me just show you. Let's flip it into field view so it agrees with this. We'll superimpose it. That's the region that's affected. That's your, that's your hypothesis that what's wrong with this eye is you've got damage here and an arcuate defect. Now, based on that hypothesis, you expect this to be thinned here. So, in fact, what happened with this eye, if you had earlier OCT, you would see that the eye probably started out life up here someplace, just like this, and then slowly lost this tissue. Okay, so let's take some examples here where we're going to make use of this. So these examples would be fall into two categories. The first large category is a yes to question one and a no or an uncertain to question two. So here's the healthy control and here's an early glaucoma uh, eye. Uh, both of them cross the midline. This is incredibly rare, by the way. This is the only one we have at the moment, I think. But it, could, it can occur. Now we look at the ganglion cell, and the answer is no to question two. Here there's a little red, so I'm really suspicious, but I'm going to say uncertain to be careful, right? So here are examples, you know, that these would fall into glaucoma eyes with arcuate-like damage out, uh, largely outside the macula central retina, like this one, and then this rare type of healthy control. All right, let's go to question three. All right, so we'll take this eye first. All right, so what are we going to do? That's a yes. Of course, it's the midline. That's, I'm really suspicious, but I'm going to say uncertain. Doesn't cost me anything. Now I'm going to go through my checklist. I'm going to first look at the ganglion cell. Well, I'm done. I mean, there's, there's a chunk out of this donut. That's what, that's what that is. And that's associated with that. So essentially, I'm done. I'm going to say yes. But if we weren't sure, we would um, go through the rest of the process and ask about the same physical location. It's good to do it anyway. So this is where we exp this is where there's an arcuate defect, the origin of the arcuate defect. Here is the thinning here. You can actually see it thinned. There it is on the thickness plot. There it is on the uh, on, on the, uh, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness plot. Right. The second thing we're going to mean is an arcuate. So right again, the hypothesis is there's, an, there's going to be arcuate damage secondary to damage right here. So it looks something like this, right? Which means this eye probably started out something like this and then slowly lost this tissue. See how all of this fits? Same physical locations, same arcuate region affected. So. This is an example of yes, right, uncertain, and then glaucoma. All right, so what about this category here? So more common, the more common root is an uncertain to question one. So let me give you some examples of it. One common uh, uh, example of this is our arcuates in early glaucoma they do not cross the midline. So here are two examples. Here is an early glaucoma eye that doesn't cross the midline. Here is a healthy control. This is what this is your your arcuate uh, artifact. Um, and so how do we distinguish between these two? Okay. 
All right, so let's take this one first. Doesn't cross the midline, so it's uncertain. Now we look at this. Well, I think you're pretty much done, aren't you? All right, we're going to look at the full report. We're going to look at the ganglion cell first. And if you superimpose this by with your eye or physically, you can see this is all part of one defect. You can also see it in the ganglion cell thickness map. So that's a yes, you're done. So this, this root here is uncertain, and then yes. So that's the same physical location, right? Remember, this is the, temp the temporal half. And so this is the region that's thinned. That's thinning there, the thinning there, and there. Same arcuate. There it is. I won't go through all this again. I think you can probably do this by yourself at this point. So you see what we're looking for. We're looking for confirmatory evidence based on the same locations being involved. And actually, even more important, just thinking in terms of where is there going to be an accurate region based on what we know about the probability maps. Okay. So this is uh, this route is relatively common. You know, we've you know, a small sample here, but we've confirmed this. You know, you think 10% of early glaucoma patients or so will have these defects that don't quite make it over the midline of, for more than one reason. These kinds here don't really extend across the midline. But once you look at the ganglion cell plot, you can see you've got topographical agreement. All right, what about this healthy control here? Again, this is not uncommon. This is, this is your arcuate-like defect, 4% of healthy controls or so. All right, how do we spot those? Well, we start out with an uncertain, right? We then go, uh, which gets us right to the full report. We go to the full report, and I'm not going to make anything of that. That doesn't look like something you'd expect of glaucoma, right? No evidence there. That donut looks really good, right? Oops. And we're, going to, we're looking at this region here, of course. So now we're going to look at this region here. Look, look how pudgy and healthy these retinal nerve fiber layers. This is a healthy eye. What's causing this defect here, right, is the fact that the thick region, because these vessels are closer to um, the temporal uh, uh, quadrant, uh, they're showing up as artificially abnormal. In fact, the thin red line here should be where the peak of the normal is. In this eye, due to anatomical differences, it's just further over. So that's there and there. So the answer here is no. Not glaucoma. Okay, finally, the last one is actually the most difficult. Fortunately, it's not that common. But what do you do about these eyes that have a lot of temp a lot of red in the temporal region, which is not typical of glauco early glaucoma? You know what? What do you do about those? In particular, look at these two guys. You know, uh, well, first of all, these are two healthy controls. These are two patients with early glaucoma. But look at these two that I've marked with a red arrow. Look how similar they are. Very hard to distinguish. All right. So here's a little trick that we've learned in general. For these eyes that have normality in the temporal region, they should have abnormal ganglion cells, right? So if the ganglion cell map is normal, like in this case here, this is not glaucoma. If that's real, this should show up. That is not glaucoma. And probably just an anatomical variation. These eyes, if on the other hand, the the uh, retinal the ganglion cell uh, thickness map here is uh, has pieces out of it consistent with glaucoma. You know? If the ganglion cell thickness map has uneven loss consistent with retinal nerve fiber map and glaucoma, then the answer is yes. Right? That's glaucoma. Finally, it just leaves these guys. It leaves the guys that. Uh, have this characteristic and this and a uh, donut. Most of those are going to be healthy controls. In a, clinic, in a clinical setting, 
I would call it an OCT suspect. Why not get a 10-2? If this was cre- is screening, I would uh, I would call it healthy. Um, so if the thickness map is has an even loss, then um, it's uncertain to question three, and at least the, and it's a suspect for clinical purposes. All right. Finally, just a few uh, words about use of visual fields. If you go to my website, the we I have much more on this topic. I, I have a, uh, I think in the last slide of this talk, there's a, a uh, the uh, URL is uh, on the slide that gets you to the website. Okay, let's talk a little bit about visual fields. Damage can be confirmed by topographically comparing visual fields and OCTs. Again, we're not going to look at mean deviations and summary metrics. We want to see local comparisons. So the local regions of the OCT probability maps can be related to visual field location points. So on these reports here, the locations of the 24-2 and 10-2 visual fields are superimposed to make it easier for you to compare them. So in the case here, both of these probability maps have the 24-2 test points in large circles and the 10-2 in the small black circles. This is done a little differently. In the Heidelberg, the 24-2 is here, and the 10-2 is down there. By the way, this is not approved yet in, for use in the U.S. This is for research purposes only in the U.S. All right. Now, here's something that may surprise you. If you're familiar with the glaucoma literature, you may have heard it said that structure comes before function that you have to lose ganglion cells before you lose visual field. Just not true. Just not true. And you can read some of these some of these articles. Some of the eyes, you will see change in OCT before visual fields, but in other eyes, it's the reverse. In any case, here's the message. In most eyes, there's good agreement. So let's take this weird looking visual field. Take these, we circle these points here, let's say, and we superimpose. That's, that's where those points are saying there's something abnormal. You notice there's another little portion here. We take that and circle that. That's what it's, where it's, the field saying is abnormal. If we have 10 2s, and I strongly recommend 10 2s, right? if we circled, let's take both of these, circle the pattern deviation. You get all of those points. You circle just the thickest, just the the, the, uh, the total deviation points, and you get those points. See the agreement here between loss in visual field and loss in, in the OCT. Same both up here. Again, you're looking for tat- patterns typical of glaucoma. So what's going on in this eye? Well, let's go back to our arcuates, right? It looks to me like we've got some damage here, right? which in field view is up here. And let's just draw that arcuate and put it in. So you, we've got some damage here that's creating different losses in this region here. That's our working hypothesis. Right? If that's true, if we take this region, we should see loss in this region here, and we do. I mean, here's... Here's where this eye probably started out. If we blow this up, you can actually see the thinning here. And you're getting this crazy visual field because it's thin in some places more than in other places. But this whole region is affected. Okay. So to summarize, this method is designed to save you time, to avoid some common mistakes, to help you understand the nature and degree of damage, and to help teach you about the rest of the report. And I'll be back with a few concluding uh, uh, words and with the promised appendix uh, about the Zeiss report. But first, we have uh, the treat of listening to Mike again and some case studies from the Illinois College of Optometry. Mike. Hey, thanks, Don. Uh, Great to be back here again and to finish up with part two of uh, my clinical case examples, where we'll be taking a a greater look uh, at the entire process 
uh, for analyzing OCTs uh, for our glaucoma suspects. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So in this section here, uh, in addition to giving a, an overview of uh, some of the cases that we've seen and some new cases, I want to remind everyone that we're going to try to focus in on uh, the more uncertain cases and the use of visual fields. Uh, of course, question three uh, involves the identification of confirmatory topographic evidence of a retinal nerve fiber layer defect on the ganglion cell probability map the circumpapillary thickness map, or B-scan, uh, the ganglion cell layer, and or RNFL thickness map. So this is, again, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, I have done a little bit of this already, so uh, most viewers, have all, or all viewers, have had a little bit of a lead into that. Um, and I'm going to start with some of the cases that we looked at and just go through it, because the, the learning process here is just to develop this uh, rote pattern of taking a methodical approach to uh, OCT scans. And even if you're not using a, uh, some of the TopCon reports that I'm showing here, it is still applicable to any report on any device. You just have to find the pieces of the puzzle, put them together, and um, you know, draw your own arrows, if you will, as you'll see on my slides as we are drawing arrows to connect pieces of the puzzle together. Okay, so uh, first case seven in part two, which is actually number one from our prior cases, if you want to go back and review, is a 66-year-old uh, female who was told that she might have glaucoma at the last exam, uh, came in for further evaluation. Uh, of course, the OCT was really uh, quite clear. You know, it was a yes for the probability, uh, RNFL probability map, uh, a yes for the ganglion cell plus uh, probability map or the ganglion cell layer map. Uh, then there was the circumpapillary RNFL and the instant and, and even on the color map down below. Uh, so if you were to just, you know, eyeball that, we might use arrows to look at this topographic agreement for the same physical location uh, for all these different elements. And it's, you know, nice when it's laid out in this design and, and easy for everyone. Uh, as, and as I just mentioned, you know, you may need to uh, maneuver the reports on your monitors to line up things or to search out the many different options of reports that different devices have so that you can get the, the circumpapillary RNFL uh, and NSTIN. You may not have an NSTIN. You may need to use a, a, the older T-SNIT. But putting all these uh, reports together really help uh, solidify the, the diagnosis there. And here's agreement between all these uh, different areas here for the uh, ganglion cell layer and the RNFL. And it's uh, up, cut out here on the thickness map. And of course, it corresponds down here. Uh, taking a look to the visual field, uh, we start to use the points on the 24-2 grid that is overlaying the RNFL probability map. And we see that it's in the same arcuate region so that when we get to our visual field, uh, we can line it up and make this anatomical uh, functional uh, agreement, the structure function correlation. So what I've done here is just to crop out the pattern deviation a plot to help line it up because this is the grid that will match up with these points and you'll see generally pretty good agreement it won't always be exact agreement but it will be a good correlating agreement so that you can again be more certain that the field defect that you're not certain about because there's so much subjectivity or variation or if the OCT defect is not quite, not quite meeting all the uh, diagnostic standards of putting these two things together uh, both for a 24-2 uh, visual field, which is up top, or the 10-2, which is down in the lower right here. Uh, this is a 10-2 visual field, and you can see the correlation uh, between these um, as I outline them here. So quite good correlation through all of that. Uh, again, it just takes some gymnastics, if you will, on your device to help line all of these up. 
Let's move over to the left eye for this uh, same patient. And again, the diagnosis was quite certain here. So we're just practicing going through the different steps that we have um, for looking at everything. Here we can add in where the field defect might be by outlining this region based on the retinal nerve fiber layer loss. We can do the same for the uh, ganglion cell region uh, down below for our 10-2 visual field. Uh, on our next slide here, we'll put the 24-2 pattern deviation plot uh, right adjacent to our uh, RNFL probability map. This, of course, ma maps out. Uh, and when you see early nasal steps, a uh, good reminder that it's important to also look in the macular region here. Um, it doesn't really mean early glaucoma. It might mean uh, more advanced glaucoma and severe stage glaucoma with central loss, which is what we see on this patient here. So if you see a nasal step, uh, think about checking for central damage with the 10-2 that I have down here in the lower right. And then of course, you know, corresponds really quite well with what we're seeing on the ganglion cell uh, map. Uh, this next case is uh, the second uh, in the series from, the, from part one. Uh, we had arcuate scotomas in both the superior and inferior fields off the right optic disc. They corresponded quite nicely to the um, ganglion cell layer plots, and we see the rest of the um, uh, uh, abnormalities on the report there. We weren't quite as certain about the visual field. Uh, it was maybe less consistent or less clear, but as so here is a close-up examination of the visual field results and the OCT uh, probability maps for the patient we were just looking at. And on the top, I have the 24-2, uh, which shows really good correlation um, uh, from the superior visual field to the uh, inferior RNFL defect that is here, and then the inferior visual field to the more superior uh, RNFL defect. Remember, this is inverted for the field view there, but there's very good correlation there. Um, there's some correlation down below on the 10-2, uh, perhaps not matching up uh, in both hemi fields as we see on the 24-2, but clearly there is uh, alignment there uh, for the structure and for the function. Uh, these are the visual field and OCT uh, cropped reports for the patient's left eye. Uh, again, this is the type of uh, clinical examination that I do on my patients in clinic every day. Um, I have a visual field, the OCT, uh, when I can uh, match up the probability map in the proper orientation here, I've got uh, a really good identification about what's going on uh, between structure and function. And I see good, uh, good correlation for the 10-2 uh, down below. So it's respecting that um, uh, vertical aspect of the patient's uh, visual field. In this next case, uh, we have a 41-year-old female who was suspected of having glaucoma with elevated intraocular pressures. Uh, the OCT that we looked at uh, did not show any definitive findings on the RNFL probability nor the ganglion cell layer probability map. Uh, we looked at the rest of the B scan uh, and um, and the thickness reports there and the Enston, just to double check, we still come up with no as an answer there. So still uh, just patient at a suspect stage. Uh, here's the left eye though, um, where we were uh, considering a retinal nerve fiber layer defect for the uh, left eye or perhaps uncertain, um, depending on how you would uh, try to uh, assess that. Uh, it did not match up with anything corresponding on the ganglion cell layer probability map. So that's uh, one of the reasons why this patient was left as a suspect. We should proceed on with our you know, question number three, looking for confirmatory topographic evidence of a retinal ner nerve fiber layer defect on all the other maps. And so uh, look at the rest of the report and from examining through the B-scan, which is pretty easy uh, and identifiable here to see that there's no defects. The Enston report does not show any significant uh, areas of abnormality. The color thickness map uh, looks good. 
So we're still probably just left with a, uh, a suspect at this point for the patient. Of course, doing the visual fields can help complete the picture for us. Uh, no visual field tests. Um, it doesn't mean the patient isn't a suspect and doesn't ever need further testing. Um, but here's a, a review of what we found as we go through our uh, Columbia University method with our different questions. And I think that uh, for this patient this time, uh, we have a number of risk factors for sure, but we can monitor the patient with, uh, with OCTs more frequently and perhaps less frequent visual fields, uh, saving ourselves and the patients some time and energy. Uh, moving on to case 10, uh, this is a 66-year-old with uh, a large uh, disc and large cup, um, the positive family history, pressures are uh, 19 and 18 in the right and left eye. Pachymetry is a little bit thin, 524 and 505, right and left eye. And the hysteresis also a little bit thin uh, or low, I should say, um, at 9.7 and 8.8. .8. So there's certainly risk factors here for this patient. Here are uh, photographs. Um, you know, maybe there's a little defect in here on the retinal nerve fiber layer. Uh, it just if it depends on how clear it is that might be showing up to you um, you know the neural retinal rim you know it's hard to tell it's not well delineated is there an early notch there is there some thinning or is there just uh, a change to the retinal nerve fiber layer at this point so let's take a look at this patient's uh, OCT which uh, for the retinal uh, nerve fiber layer probability map is uh, probably a yes, uh, perhaps an uncertain for some of you uh, because there's not clear uh, connection back to the disc here. It does appear to cross the vertical midline and uh, the inferior portion uh, does seem to correlate with what's going on on the ganglion cell layer map down below. Um, so there's uh, the black arrow here is highlighting that for us to the correlation there. We should move over and take a look at um, the, uh, the uh, thickness map for the probability. Remember to invert this and to look out here. It does look like there's a piece taken out there. So those two things correlate. So uh, that's a stronger sign for me. Uh, take a look at the Enston. Uh, plot. There's a, a real thinning to the retinal nerve fiber layer that's coming from the circumpapillary B scan. And then we can also see this uh, dark blue wedge defect on the color map. So probably more yes than uncertain after you go through all of those steps there. And the question really might be, do you get a 24-2 or a 10-2? I think the answer is both to those. Uh, whichever one you want to get first uh, may depend on, on the specifics of the patient and uh, their ability to do tests. So question three is a yes for this uh, subject. This is the subject's uh, left eye with the 24-2 uh, uh, visual field. Uh, high false positives um, and fixation losses, although that might just be from uh, some misalignment uh, of the patient. Uh, but the 20% high false positives uh, sort of you know, questions the reliability of this report. Uh, you can try and line up what you see on the pattern deviation uh, report uh, and the total deviation map with the grid here. There's not really too much correlation. There's some defects there you know, probably has to be repeated, of course. For the 10-2 for the same patient, uh, again, just, you know, try to do your best to, with your instrumentation and monitors to line up uh, whatever OCT device you have, whatever aspect of the report, so you can zero in on uh, these areas here and look to see that they're you know, there's likely to be some correlation between the uh, visual field defect and the uh, ganglion cell layer map there. Uh, for case number 11, this is a 40-year-old suspect from uh, past exams with a large CD ratio, pressure in the mid-teens, uh, good health, no other medications. Uh, photographs uh, of the optic disc are here. You know, some large and perhaps suspicious cupping. I don't think that there's anything definitive about glaucoma there. Uh, the rest of the clinical findings really support the uh, reason for working up and evaluating this patient. 
Uh, the OCT, um, you know, as we analyze the RNFL probability, you know, that little thing is most likely nothing, something you shouldn't be worried about. So that's a no. It doesn't really correlate with anything down below on the ganglion cell probability map. Um, so we can move over to the left eye. Um, here, maybe a little artifact of one of those arcuate type of defects that Don talked about in the previous lecture. Uh, you might list that as an uncertain. Uh, it doesn't line up with anything in the ganglion cell layer probability map. So uh, we have to move on to question three. Look at the rest of the maps. Is there anything uh, on the ganglion cell probability map that matches up on the thickness map? Not really. I don't see any uh, missing pieces of the donut there. How about for the RNFL thickness map? No. And uh, nor for the um, um, probability map uh, and thickness map uh, down below. When we look at this patient's visual fields, we get normal visual fields. And I think our plan for this patient is, again, we can utilize more OCT uh, testing to follow the patient, you know, uh, frequency of approximately once a year, uh, more or less, depending on uh, all the other risk factors that you add up for the patient, and uh, perhaps don't need as many visual fields for the patient at this time. I'm not saying not to do any, but you can probably do fewer of them. Uh, for our next case, we have a 43-year-old uh, female with a past uh, treatment at the history of uh, treatment for glaucoma in the past. Uh, there are no current medications and she's not been taking eye drops for the past two years. Uh, pressure currently is 23 and 22. Uh, right eye, left eye. Corneal thickness is uh, 550 and 555. And uh, the uh, clinicians have noted that there's a suspicious disc and the patient is myopic. Uh, the OCT scan shows us what is not classical for glaucoma. You know, there's a lot of uh, nasal uh, defect over here. Perhaps that's from um, a bad scan, a high myopia, uh, patients uh, turning their head in the instrument, uh, oblique or tilted insertion on the disc, which you might be able to see a little bit down here on the on foss. But then you do have these two arcuate-like um, abnormalities here. Those might be um, uh, true RNFL defects. They don't cross the midline. Um, so I think at best you might say that this is uncertain. Uh, when you look down below to try and match it up on the uh, ganglion cell map, you know, there, there doesn't appear to be really good clear correlation there. And the ganglion cell probability map doesn't match up with anything on the uh, uh, ganglion cell thickness map. Uh, there is some irregularity to the circumpapillary RNFLB scan, um, maybe an area of some thinning over here. Um, you know, not too much abnormal on the thickness map. You know, the further evaluation is likely necessary for this patient. You can't rely just on the OCT for this patient. You have to consider which visual field to get. Uh, we obtained a 24-2 for the patient. Uh, now you can see the patient's uh, fundus photo in a, with a, a good clear view, and there was no field defects. And we, uh, you know, identified the patient still just as a suspect at this time. Here's the left eye. Again, some abnormalities on the RNFL probability plot, uh, but nothing that is definitive nor uh, classical for our, our glaucomatous-like defects. The glaucoma, glauco, the ganglion cell probability map down below also is uncertain, uh, along with the thickness map. Here's the visual field and uh, the photograph. Uh, really nothing uh, clearly identifying glaucoma at this time. Follow with the OCT, less frequent visual fields, um, and the patient remains as a suspect. And for our uh, case 13, this is a 60-year-old male. I had an exam one month ago with high IOP on non-contact tonometry and on Goldman applanation tonometry. It is hypertensive, high cholesterol, and a borderline type 2 diabetic. No family history of glaucoma with pressures of 23 in each eye. Uh, and is, you know, was referred in as a glaucoma suspect. Um, here's a, a quick snapshot of the uh, TopCon report looking at the probability map. Uh, 
where you know we're at best uncertain. You know, there's not a clear arcuate defect in here. Uh, still uncertain on the ganglion cell map down below, and this might be more artifact or noise. Uh, remember, if it's just the ganglion cell layer uh, probability map that's abnormal, uh, really examine the macula um, for other diseases and other conditions. It's uh, less, much less likely to be glaucoma. Uh, look at the uh, B scan and the Enston uh, plots there. And, uh, not really clear that there's any defect here. Again, a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, artifact and noise, probably a poor quality scan, maybe some movement, uh, tilting of the uh, or a misorientation of the patient's eye, uh, and some cropping here. Even though the image quality score is decent, this is not the best quality scan, and just a lot of um, uncertainty and, and artifact on the ganglion cell map as well. Uh, we get similar findings on the uh, panel map reports from the uh, Zeiss instrument, uh, leaving us uncertain for the right and left eye as well. And then here are the photographs uh, for this patient. Now, fortunately for this patient, you know, the visual fields uh, were, you know, uh, reliable. Uh, well, I'm sorry, at least reliable for the left eye. Uh, high false positives at 17% for the right eye, but mostly normal, and we weren't highly suspicious of glaucoma. Uh, now, the more debatable question that uh, I don't know there's a perfect resolution to is how do we follow this patient? You know, the OCTs are abnormal, but probably with artifact. Um, you could certainly follow them for change over time, glaucoma being something that would change over time and other things uh, generally would not. Um, you might just do visual fields given that those are a more clean result for this patient. Um, it's a great clinical debate discussion. So that's the end of our uh, cases here. I'm going to turn it back over to Don to summarize everything for us. Thank you. For us, thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was great. It really helps. I think make some of the points clearer that I was trying to get across. So before I briefly sum, uh, sum this up, I had promised that I would tell you a few, uh, give you a, a short tutorial on how to use this method if you had Zeiss reports. So the Zeiss reports were making use of, of the Zeiss panel map and the report from the macular cube scan. And again, if you don't, uh, this one you're probably familiar with. If you're not familiar with this, um, go to Google or um, ask your Zeiss rep. And we're just going to be using the portions of the report here that I've left unblocked. And this slide is just meant to help you. Um, you may want to study it because I'm going to go do it pretty quickly, but it's meant to help you understand the relationship between the reports I've been showing you and these different elements. And so here's a brief summary of that. This panel map here is a combination of two probability maps. It's a combination of the retinal nerve fibrillary probability map and the ganglion cell probability map. And unlike this one, these here, it's in retina view. This thickness map is equivalent to the thickness map here. It's just made up of two pieces, right? This uh, thickness, this uh, uh, circumpapillary retinal nerve fibrillary thickness of a B scan is the same as this, except this is the traditional T snit with nasals in the middle. This is instant with temporals in the middle. You can change this, I believe, uh, from the default. Uh, and if you don't know how, again, speak to your rep. All right, and then the ganglion cell thickness map is the same as this. So that's how you relate these elements. So we've modified the process a little bit. Uh, so now I'm not going to call it question one. There are just two questions, question A and B. Question A will sound familiar. But in this case, on the combined, right, on the combined P maps on the, on the panel map, is there an abnormal region consistent with glaucoma damage, which includes red near the temporal half of the disc? So you need red here, and you need something that looks like it's continuous to say yes. Right? No means no red near the temporal half. That's the same. So this is a no, and that's that's that will work uh, quite well. Um, now, whether you uh, so let's go back to this map. Whether you say yes or uncertain, we want you to take a look at the thickness map to make sure this is right. Because sometimes there can be red here that that uh, is um, artifactual. Um, so is this real? Well, once you see confirmation on this thickness map, you know it's real. 
So if, if this gets confirmed, that's a, then that's a yes. Everything else is uncertain, and you have to take a look carefully at these plots here. Okay. All right. So which are which are found here? In this particular case, it would be yes. In other, uh, in some cases, it might be no. In other cases, it might be uncertain. We're going to put a tutorial on my website at some point that will go into a great detail of this, uh, hopefully soon. So you may want to check that. Okay. Now, what Manos uh, Thasmus pointed out when he presented this in uh, at the uh, AAO meeting was that we're it's the same principles. We're still looking for patterns typical of glaucomatous damage, not pie charts or summary statistics. The Probability maps are essential, and you can find them on the panel map. There's no abnormal region near the temporal half of this, then this is not glaucoma. If the same glaucomatous defect is confirmed on ganglion cell and retinal nerve pair maps, then you can be confident it's optic neuropathy consistent with glaucoma. And finally, glaucoma shows topographic agreement across the elements of the reports, whereas artifacts do not. And it's always wise to look at a good quality scan. That's hard to find uh, on the Zeiss reports. Again, talk to your rep and see if you can get them to make it to make it uh, readily available. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, Mike and I want to thank you for listening to this. Uh, if you want to hear more about the Columbia Method, these two articles have a fair amount of detail in them. Uh, here, if you're interested in the general approach behind the Hood Report, here are three summary articles that will give you more than you possibly want to know, maybe, um, but um, but would, would be very helpful for some for any of you who want to know about the details. You can get to my website with this, and on the website we've got some simple summaries of our approach as well as some lectures. So with that, I just uh, oh, and by the way, some of these lectures that I'm preparing, as well as some of the lectures that are already there cover things we didn't cover. So it's important to note what we didn't cover today. We didn't talk about identifying other kinds of artifacts, like bad scans. We uh, only touched on comparing visual fields in OCT regions. You can use this technique, by the way, with high myopia. It's just not true that you can't. You can use this technique with advanced glaucoma also. Uh, and I've got lectures already on the website on those topics. I'm going to add some more. And then finally, you want to learn to identify other retinal and optic nerve di diseases that can masquerade as glaucoma. And again, it's an older lecture on that. There'll be a newer one at some point. All right, having said that, um, I just want to come back and remind you that this was a, a, a recording, a re-recording of a course that we gave at the AAO. And uh, on behalf of um, Mike Schiglazian, uh, and I want to thank you for listening uh, to this.